Well, good evening. Hope everybody had plenty to eat today. We uh, we enjoy our fellowship. I'm glad we're able to get this going again. And now as we kick up and go out throughout the rest of the uh, year, we're going to be doing our second, fourth Wednesdays again, and we'll be kicking up our third Wednesday for prayer night. So that's going to be next Wednesday. We want to make sure everybody is aware of that. Um, now, we won't be doing the food on the prayer night. So... We want you to come and join us. It's going to be, I think we said 6.30, didn't we? Isn't that what we set that up for? Yeah. So it'll be 6.30 next Wednesday, but it'll, we'll just come in, and at 6.30 we start praying. We're not going to be talking. We're not going to be sharing what we're going to pray about. We're just going to be praying. And we'll pray for an hour. If we go longer, that's fine, but we, we can at least go till 7.30, and we'll see where the Lord takes it from there. But I hope that you can come out and join. I think we need, we need more prayer. For one another, we need more prayer even for ourselves, and we need prayer for this country and this world that we live in. Um, and we need prayer for the church abroad. Um, Jack and I were talking the other day, and, um, and actually I think I was talking to Paul about this same thing. You know, there are many different teachers and pastors that have a specific message. The Lord has just laid on their heart. Uh, the message that the Lord has laid on my heart is more to the church in general, and that is we have to wake up. We have to be prepared. We need to be alert as the church, the bride of Christ, needs to be active as the bride should be. Now, we'll get into Sunday's message a little bit. I don't want to talk too much about that, but one aspect of what we're going to talk about is there are certain theories that believe that the Lord won't come back and reign on this earth for a thousand years because the church is going to be so widespread that the whole world is going to get saved and the church is going to lead it in for that thousand years and then for Christ to come back. That's not what the Bible teaches, and I don't want to get too much into that, but my point of this is, is that the church, the purpose of the church is to point to Jesus Christ, not to try to be Jesus Christ. It's the Lord's role to come and rule and reign. And it's the Lord's role to take his bride home. But while we're here, we're to be active and speaking truth and teaching truth from the word of God and not letting the world or anybody else come in the way and diffuse that. And there's a challenge in that for the church because today the church, and, and I was talking, I had a great conversation with a local business guy this week. As a matter of fact, we had about four people involved in this conversation. The Lord just opened up wonderful time of sharing and he's he's catholic his wife is protestant but he doesn't understand a lot of the terminologies you know well, why does somebody got to get saved what do you mean get saved you know from the catholic church they don't use that term and we were able to talk about that and what it means i said well you're saved from eternal damnation and separation from god that's what you're saved from and we were able to talk about that and there was this young boy he was just i'd say he's probably about maybe 21 22 years old and he was right in the middle of listening, didn't comment much. But I asked him specifically, I said, I said, uh, you know, I said, sometimes it's harder to get the younger people in. He said, well, I'm not a Christian. And I said, well, that's an honest answer. I said, I'd like to talk with you one-on-one -on -one when we can. And he's willing to do that. We just hadn't had the chance to do that. But he listened to all the other conversation that was going on. And he was intently listening. And we were talking about how the church has been misrepresented. And we've talked about how things have taken people to not want to go to church or be a part of the church because of what the church has represented itself to be. Either about money. And that's a big one. Too many churches are about money. And they get that a lot. People get that and, and think that a lot of the church is that way because of what they see on these television programs. And the name it, claim it group. And the give me this and give me that group. And then you have others that misrepresent Jesus by he's only this or he's only that. There's a, there's a local pastor I hear every now and then. And he, he advertises one of his services and he says, the only Jesus I know is the healing Jesus. Well, I know a lot more about Jesus than just healing. He has a whole lot more attributes and more gifts to give than just healing. And we sometimes want to put God into our own little box. And again, the church needs to come to the word of God once again, focus and let that be our standard. And if we, if we stay there, we can't go wrong. We can't go wrong. 
And that's the message. That's you hear this a lot in the teaching that that comes up on Wednesdays and on Sundays. It's the same message. And I don't like to be repetitive, and I don't want people to think that I'm trying to beat up the church or beat up this country. I'm just pointing out truth according to the Word of God. And I see so many things happening in our world today and in our churches today that are not aligning to God's Word. So we need to be prepared, we need to be alert, and we need to be staying and focusing. And I encourage you to be in the Word and study and read and and know what the Bible teaches so that you can have conversations like the one I had the other day where the Lord was just just giving me Scripture and giving me things to talk about, and we were able to really break things down in a simple form where I believe that particularly one of the people understood things differently. And so these, that's what we need to be able to do and be prepared to do uh, because that's the call of the church As while we're here. We're to be witnesses into this world. And if someone can come to a church and go into the world and say, I don't see any difference, then there's a problem. There's a problem. And we need to address that on our knees. And we're going to do that more and more again as we get into the Wednesday prayer nights. And I encourage you to come out for that. But tonight, we're going to get back into the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, we're in chapter 7, and I know it's been a while. I think our last uh, Wednesday was the, the second week in December, the second Wednesday in December. And we covered all the way up to chapter 11. I'm just going to briefly kind of bring us up to speed there. As we began this chapter, we saw Solomon was continuing in, in his examination of life without a godly perspective. He's basically, he's a wise man, he knows the spiritual aspect of things, but he's challenging the world and challenging life by saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try all these things, I want to see if they work or they don't work. And, and so he's looking at, at what, he's, what, he's, um, what he's putting into perspective is from a worldly standpoint. And I also mentioned before that a lot of what we see in this chapter is also, he puts a lot of Proverbs here. So we see a lot of Proverbs mixed in to this particular uh, passage or this particular chapter. Um, we know that Solomon uh, brought to us the fact that death is inevitable. We covered that in our last study. No one can escape it. And by living our life with that understanding, we can gain wisdom regarding how we're supposed to live. See, and that's, uh, that's the realistic view of life and death. If you're looking at death from a fearful standpoint, then you're, just, you're, you're focusing on it the wrong way because then it's just about fear and you're afraid to do this and you're afraid to do that and all the challenges that come with fear. But if you're accepting the reality that we're born and the moment you're born, you begin to die, that's literally what happens. I mean, you know, you're in a dying, decaying body. It grows to a certain point and then it starts going the other way. We understand that, but we can gain wisdom by learning to focus on the Lord during our life and learn how we're to live while we're here and not focus on the death itself. And we we looked at Psalm 90, verse 12, that says, to teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And we need that heart of wisdom, and we need to... To, to focus on that, not that we focus on the morbid, oh, I'm dying, woe is me, Eeyore, you remember Eeyore? Oh, bother, why bother, it's all bad, you know? It's not how we're supposed to live our life. But we're also supposed to live in the realm of reality and not that oh, I'm going to live forever. And that's not going to happen until Jesus either returns to this earth or until we meet him in heaven and then we have the eternal life. So we have those aspects of what we've covered before. Um, we talked about oppression and suffering through oppression. And we learned that if we only focus on the circumstance instead of the Lord, we find ourselves walking in the, in the flesh and not in the spirit. In order to walk in the spirit, we've got to be focused on spiritual things. We've got to be focused on Jesus. And so we covered that in our last study. Uh, we talked about how a patient spirit keeps calm and listens more than it speaks. But um, a proud spirit stirs up trouble and speaks more than it listens. All this we covered in our last study. So today we're going to pick up in verse 11, and we're going to try to finish the chapter. So, Father, we ask that you would give us wisdom as we study the book of wisdom, as we go through this and learn more and more of what your word has to teach us. And we thank you for your word, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, beginning with verse 11. Wisdom is good with an inheritance and profitable to those who see the sun. For wisdom is a defense as money is a defense. But the excellence of knowledge is that wisdom gives life to those who have it. Money does not. And often we hear of someone inheriting money and the damage it brought upon their lives because of the lack of wisdom. Maybe they won the lottery. Maybe they inherited a bunch of money, uh, however it came, came to be. But money is often used to satisfy the desires of the flesh. And you'll hear people say, well, I don't love money, but I sure wished I had more of it. Because you can buy it. It may not buy happiness, but it can buy me a bunch of stuff. Money is always a desire in the flesh because with it you can purchase, you can buy, you can try to satisfy the desires of the flesh. But wisdom gives life where money cannot. Proverbs 19.8 says, He who gets wisdom loves his own soul. He who keeps understanding will find good. And Proverbs 29.3 says, Whoever loves wisdom makes his father rejoice, but a companion of harlots wastes his wealth. And believe me, if you're in a company of harlots or a company of other people who are hanging out with harlots or doing what those people do, they will drain every dime off of you. They will take it off of you. Before you know it, you had money in your hand and it's gone. It's gone. And 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith, and in their greediness, and pierced themselves through many or with many sorrows. And that's a pretty vivid example and very scripturally true when you're talking about the love of money. Now, you know, again, it doesn't say that money is a root of all evil. It says the love of money is a root of all evil. But let me tell you this, the more you have, the easier it is to love it. And the more fearful you are to lose it. It's the way the mind works. And so sometimes people find themselves in love with money, not realizing it because they didn't when they started, but now it's kind of got a hold of them. They like the pleasures. They like the, the, what they can get. They like what they can do. And so the love of money is just around the corner for those who seek to gain more and more of it. And it says here, for some have strayed from the faith in their greediness. See, money will pull you away from faith. It will pull you away from your faith in the Lord because when you're de dependent upon God, completely and totally dependent upon Him, you, you, you're not greedy. You're just coming to Him, Lord, I thank You that You're providing my needs. And Lord, You know I have this need. And yes, I would like to have this, but I put that on the shelf with the wants. I just know that You're my provider and I trust You with that. But then you get that met, and then you get extra, and you get extra, and you give extra, and the next thing you know, you wind up holding on to it, wanting more of it. And greed creeps in. And it says it pierces themselves, it pierces themselves through. I mean, the picture of that is that you're actually taking a spear and, and piercing yourself with this love of money. And there are many sorrows that come with it. A lot of people believe that if I only had all this money, I wouldn't have any problems. No, you wouldn't have the same problems. You would have problems and more of them in ways you've never seen before. Because you'll also find out you have relatives you never knew. And they'll be coming out of the woodwork. And the friends from high school will be looking you up. People you didn't even know and they didn't like you then and they don't like you now, but they like your money. And that's how this stuff works. So we have to make sure that we're focused upon the Lord, that we don't allow money to get in the way, but our inheritance is wisdom. And if we hold on to wisdom as our inheritance, it's profitable. It's profitable for us to grow spiritually. It's profitable for us to live in this fallen world with our relationship with Jesus Christ. Verses 13 through 15. Consider the work of God. For who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, 
in prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider, surely God has appointed the one as well as the other, so that man can find out nothing that will come after him. Now these verses are like gold nuggets for those who are walking with the Lord. Accepting these truths by faith, grabbing a hold of these truths, and, and wrapping, as, as Proverbs 3 says, writing them upon the table of your heart, it takes a lot of pressure off of your shoulders. It takes us off our need-to-know mentalities as well. See, we're a, we're a group of people that we need to know. We want to know the answers. It's funny, you know, I'm, I'm a little different than most. When, when I go to the doctor, I go because I'm sick. I don't go any other time. Because, you, you know what, if you stay away from doctors, you, you stay well longer. But you go to the doctor because you're sick. You know, okay, well, I know what my symptoms are. I tell him. He tells me what's wrong with me. I get the medicine and I leave. Now, my dad is going to want to talk to this doctor, and he's going to want this doctor to explain everything about what's going on with him. I don't need to know all that. I want to get out of there as quick as I can. And you know, it's funny, the older generation, they had the same doctor from who knows when. They just had the same doctor. It was a smaller community. There weren't that many doctors around. They had a relationship with their doctor. And today, and their, my parents being older, they do not want to change doctors. Because they want somebody that's going to spend time and talking to them and going through the whole thing. I want an in-and-out revolving door. I don't want to spend time in the doctor's office. But that's the change in mentality in generations. I believe that that happens a lot in, you know, from one generation to the other when things happen. But you may be one of those who likes to get all the answers when you go to the doctor. But let me tell you a little secret. The doctor don't have all the answers. He's practicing medicine. And he's practicing on you. So be careful where you're getting all your information. But accepting these truths, walking with the Lord, takes a lot of pressure off our need to know the mentality. If God does it, you can't undo it. That's another truth here. If God sets something into place, he makes it happen, you cannot undo it. Nor can Satan undo what God has done. No one can undo what God has done. God takes us through good and bad situations. And in this world, there's always going to be both. There's going to be good and there's going to be bad. And it's going to hit all because it rains on the just and the unjust. And you can't name and claim your way out of a place where God has placed you. And that's a very important thing for the church to hear today who is always talking about prosperity, always talking about walking above this and walking above that. Let me tell you something. God sometimes places you in these circumstances. It may not be anything you did. It may not be what somebody else did. He will use whatever he needs to to put you in a place where you're looking to him, not to yourself or not to some other need of provision. And it's so important that we understand that. But you cannot change what God has put into place. And if God chooses or allows something to happen, there's a purpose in there greater than sometimes we're going to understand. And we can look at Job for that. In Job 2, verses 7 through 10, it says, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Now this is a hurting person, physically hurting, emotionally hurting, spiritually hurting. He's hurting on all levels. He's lost his family. Now he's got these painful sores, and he's, he's, scri he's scraping them and, because they itch and bother them with a piece of broken pottery. I mean, this picture is not a picture that these name it and claim it people want to look at. But this is where Job was. And then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But Job said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall, not, and shall we not accept adversity? 
we have to be in this mindset, spiritual mindset, to understand that it's not going to be a lot, just a bed of roses. And if it is, there's thorns mixed in. And we're going to have to always keep our eyes on the Lord and the good and the bad and the ugly because if we don't, we'll find ourselves tripped up. We'll either A, be walking on the mountaintop and forget God's there and brought us there. Or we'll be in the valley and we're complaining against God. But God is with you throughout every circumstance of life. He never leaves or forsakes his children. He never does. There are times we may think he's left, but the truth is, is the only reason we feel that way is because we're focusing on ourselves and not on him. He is literally with you in every circumstance that you go through. Matthew 5, 45, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. It's all in his hands. Everything is in his hands. And it's so important that we take that truth and we hold on to it because if you're on the mountaintop today, be careful tomorrow's coming. But if you're in the valley today, be joyful because tomorrow's coming. But always focus on Jesus, whatever the circumstance may be that you happen to be in at this point in time in life. Now verses 15 through 18. I've seen everything in my days of vanity. There's a just man who perishes in his righteousness, and there's a wicked man who prolongs life in his wickedness. Do not be overly righteous, nor be overly wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Do not be overly wicked, nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you grasp this, and also not remove your hand from the other, for he who fears God will escape them all. Now there's a, there's a message in here that we really need to grab a hold of because some people do try to be over spiritual in their lives and they put down people who are going through things because they're trying to walk on this mountaintop that they're really not on themselves. But they're trying to make themselves to look more spiritual than others. And then there's other times when, um, when you are uh, foolish in the walk, and other people are trying to help you pull that out, and you don't want to hear any part of that. And so it's extremes. He's talking about extremes here. Balance is what we need. Balance is ultimately what we seek, and only Christ is balanced. You know, there's a lot of talk about chemical imbalance in our brains, and there's a lot of people that struggle with depression, and we struggle with a lot of different things. And the truth here is, is that in balance, spiritually, is what we need. Christ needs to be who we're focused on at all times in, in all aspects of our lives. By spending all of our time in studying and learning, but not using the knowledge for ministering to others, is being over-spiritual. Over yeah, you have knowledge, and you may have even wisdom, but if you're not sharing it with anyone, you're just, you're just putting yourself over here above others in a sense. And that's not what we're called to do. And hiding away and being critical toward others because they don't study and seek the way that you do. And that's how sometimes it can be. If we, if we just dive in, but we keep it all over here, then we expect other people to do the same thing. One thing I found in ministry, and this is a very, I want everybody to hear this very clearly. In ministry, whatever you're working and doing in the ministry of God is no more important than when somebody else is doing. And you can never, ever, ever expect everybody else to be as excited about you are if that's not the call that they have. It doesn't matter what the ministry is. And this is something that really that, that Christians struggle with. I've had people come, man, I want to do this, but nobody else is excited about this. And I said, well, then you're going to do it alone. If God's given you the excitement, if he's given you the, the call, then you take that with everything in you. You give it to the Lord and let him work it through you, and he will bring and align with you. The people need to be aligned with you. But if they're not there, then it's between you and the Lord. If it's from him. But ministry is one of those things to where we, we, we gain ownership. We start taking ownership and the minute you take ownership of your ministry as though it's yours is the very minute that you'll be mad at somebody else that either tries to help 
or they don't accept what you've done the way that you wanted them to accept it. It's all about pride. And that's not who we're called to be. We have to be careful about that. Another way of being over-spiritual is to declare understanding where others can't. Oh, God gave me wisdom on this. I understand this. Oh, he whispered in the ear something. He didn't tell Paul. He didn't tell James. He didn't tell John. He didn't tell any of the guys in the Bible. But you've got this extra. That You need to step away from that. If somebody has clarity on something that is not scriptural, then you need to move away from it because it's not you, everything that we everything that we do. God always, through His Holy Spirit, will confirm Himself in His Word. Always, and we have to make sure that we're not stepping out and hearing voices and claiming we have all this knowledge and understanding about things that nobody else has. I would question what voice they're listening to. We have to make sure it lines up with God's word. But drawing spiritual conclusions on things that are not clearly defined in Scripture to the point of division, and there's been many theologians that have done this. They've had to have an answer. They've had to have some way to explain something, so they take it beyond the written word, and the next thing you know, there's an argument between them and somebody who's taking it in a different direction and using the same Scriptures to do it. And neither one of them has the insight. But they had to know something, and they had to present something. Things that we don't know, it's okay to say we don't know. I don't know. Pretty easy to say, actually, for me. (laughs) There's a lot I don't know. And I'm okay with that, because I know the one that does know. And that's what we we have to keep our faith in him. So how can one be overly wicked or foolish? Well, by living a life with no clarity of God's word. Someone who may go to church but doesn't know a lick about what the Bible teaches. Someone who claims that they're a Christian, but have never been taught, never have learned anything, and they're living their life as though, well, I'm okay because I know about God or I've been to church, so therefore I can do what I want to do. That's overly wicked. They're staying on milk as babes. They're not maturing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior and continuing to walk in the flesh, not submitting to the Holy Spirit. So what's the balance? What's the balance between being over-righteous or over-wicked? One word. Humility. Humility. That's what brings the balance. Because if you're humble enough to say you don't know what you think you know, then you're able then to have conversations with other people and accept where they're coming from because they may not know either, but you're both engaging based on what the Word of God teaches. And if you're being wicked or not living for God, but you claim to be a Christian, you need to be humble and accept the fact that you need to repent. So the word humility is the balance between the two. The Lord loves a humble heart. And let me tell you this today. If you've walked in in a relationship with God, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't humble yourself before the Lord, He will humble you. And He will do it in a way that's not pleasant. We need to humble ourselves before the Lord. Humble yourself to learn that God may use you, understanding you will never have all the answers, and that's okay. And on the other side, humble yourself from your pride and ignorance, submitting to the Lord, and having a desire to grow in our faith and not be satisfied with milk, but learn to chew the meat of the word. Humility, that's the balance between the two. Now, verses 19 through 22, Wisdom strengthens the wise more than ten rulers of the city. There's not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. Also do not take to heart everything people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. For many times also your, you, your own heart has known that even you have cursed others. See, this is going back to that don't pull the speck out of your brother's eye when you've got a plank in your own. Because if we really examine our hearts, we know that a lot of times the things that we hold other people accountable for are things that we ourselves are guilty of. Wisdom from God 
gives you strength more than ten rulers because men are sinners, plain and simple. They're just sinners, plain and simple. Wisdom will point you to Jesus. The world will point you to a self-help book or a video or whatever they're using now, MP3s, I don't know. The only book that brings help is the Bible. And it's not self-help, it's Jesus' help. And it's a struggle. It's a struggle in this world. I mean, it's everywhere. I, uh, I told Jennifer today, I went to a, a business networking lunch today. I haven't been to one in quite a while. I've, you know, the Lord has got my heart and mind focused on so many other things than, than it used to be. And I felt completely out of place at this place today. I just, I knew some of these people. I've known them for years. Not all of them, but some of them. This was a new group that I uh, had never been to. But there are people that I've known in the community that are there. And I looked around and all I could hear and all I could see was um, raising money for this and raising money for that and doing this for this and doing this for that and all secular causes, all things that, you know, some of them were good causes, don't get me wrong, but, but the, the point behind it and the message that I hear at these meetings, and, I, and some churches have this same message, and that is, well, help, your, help others so you can help yourself. That's really what they're saying. You know, they want you, oh, you need to, you need to learn to care about other people. Yeah, you do, but for their sake, not for yours. And see, so many times what happens in the world and it can creep into the church is that it's manipulation ploy. If I can help you get what you want, then you're going to get me what I want. And that's the business world. That's the model. That's what's out there. And I was just, I was literally depressed when I walked out of that meeting. I just, I told Jennifer, I just can't do this anymore. I can't do it anymore. You know, and she said, well, you know, what about, you know, develop a new business? I said, I pray that God will give me other ways to do that. I can't do this anymore. Not like that. It's just not me. I am not that person anymore. And God showed me how to be that person years ago for the very purpose of realizing that when he moved me in another direction, how different and how more focused on him I needed to be. It was like he revealed so many things over the last few years. Many things were great things that he revealed to me through the business world. Many things were things that I'm so glad that he's taken away. But it's not, it's not about gain. And that's all the world knows is how to gain and how to manipulate to get it. And I, it's just, I don't know, like I said, it, it, it was just a very discouraging time for me during that luncheon. Now, this verse regarding not taking to heart everything people say, it's speaking about gossip. Because people will gossip, and people will talk about people, and they will say things, and they will do things. People do it, and on some level, I think we all do it. I think it's just part of the, the fleshly part of ourselves. It just so easily comes out when things are going on. And let me say that as a pastor, I had to develop thick skin. Because there are people that do not like my style, like what I do, like how I lead. There are people that don't like it. I mean, I'm not saying that there's a lot, but there are some that don't. Some have come, some have gone. And I can't please everybody, nor can you. And in the church, we're not called to. Yes, we're called to peace, but we're not called to appease. We're called to love one another. And Paul even said, you know, you know, be at peace with your brother as, as much as is up to you. But there are times to release and let go. And you can't hold that, those negative feelings upon yourself and carry that around when you know that people are not in agreement or not following or not, you know, they, there's just not, it's not a connection there. And you have to be careful that you... Um, that you don't fall into that trap of listening for every little word of criticism. And there are some that if they're criticized, they want to change something so they can get that person to like them. That's a politician, or at least that's what they'll tell you. They don't really want to change. They just want you to think that they change. 
but they can't stand to have somebody disagree with them. And you ask them a hard question, they won't give you an answer, they'll just talk around it. And that's how that works. But as a pastor and as a teacher and as a leader of this church, I can't please anyone, everyone, and I don't try. I'm going to stay in line with what God has called me to do and the leaders of the church to do and the vision for the church. And it's very simple. The vision is not changed from day one. It's to stay in prayer, okay? Uh, continue in prayer, continue studying the Word, and that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to always keep it simple. We don't need to move into this big plan of whatever. God will provide, and He always has, and He always will. And it's not my job to make everybody happy, and some will not be very kind when they don't get their way. It happens. But it is my job to shepherd. It's my job to teach and to encourage. And most importantly, it's my job to point you to Jesus. That's the role of a pastor and teacher and preacher, pointing to Jesus. And that's all we're called to do. But I, too, have accountability. And if I'm not careful, I can also give an earful about the those that I disagree with. And I have to take that very carefully before the Lord because it's easy to find myself complaining. And it's easy to find myself not liking the situation around other people. We're all accountable to God for the way we handle authority. Period. We're all accountable to God. And I'm, for one, thankful for His mercy and His grace because He bestows it upon all of us. But that takes us back to that word of humility. First, acknowledging and knowing that we're all vulnerable. We're all guilty to some degree, but taking that before the Lord and leaving it in His hands and not carrying this, you know, on our shoulders or in carrying it. Because here's the thing, if you find yourself that you've been, if somebody's brought a grievance upon you and you're thin-skinned, the first thing you're going to want to do is take it to somebody else and talk it out. And then to somebody else, and then to somebody else. And you try to build an alliance so that you can have a group of people to come back to the person that offended you. That's not what the Bible says we're to do. If you've been offended, you go to the person. And if they biblically, if they're not in line with God's word and what they've done, then you go. If they won't hear you, then you go back with a witness and you talk with them. If they won't hear them, then you bring back another witness. You take them before the church. At that point, you part ways. That's the biblical way to handle these type of things. But I am grant, again, I'm very thankful for his mercy and his grace. Now, verses 23 through 25. All this I have proved by wisdom, I said. I will be wise, but it was far from me. As for that which is far off and exceedingly deep, who can find it out? I applied my heart to know, to search and seek out wisdom and the reason of things, to know the wickedness of folly, even of the foolishness and madness. Now, I believe that what Solomon is saying here is that through wisdom, he discerned that just desiring to be wise doesn't make you wise. Just desiring to have something doesn't make it happen. Uh, what was the old, if you can think it, you can be it, or something like that. There's old saying in the, in the, in the worldly system, you know, um, that's not true. It's not true. If you want to be wise, you have to seek out wisdom from the wise one, and that's Jesus, through his word. That's where you're going to gain wisdom. You can't just make it happen. And the deep things from God are not found by determination, but they're given by the Holy Spirit. The more you ask, the more you knock, the more you seek, the more he gives. But he wants us to keep knocking, keep asking, keep seeking. Why? Because that keeps us focused on the, the, the determining factor that we are dependent upon him and we need more of him. So we have to keep asking, keep knocking, keep seeking. But just to say, hey, I want this, okay, I'm, I'm going to think it, I'm going to make it happen. Oh, 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 oh. No, I'm still driving a Kia. I mean, I, I really thought I was going to go out there and see something else sitting in the parking lot. No, it's just a Kia. Can't make that Kia be something else. That's like evolution. 
You know, I've never seen a, uh, I've never seen a Volkswagen turn into a Cadillac. It's just impossible. But this is, how, this is how we're taught in the world. If you want it, you can have it. If you want to be it, you can be it. Be all you can be. All of this stuff about me, 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 me. Self this, self that. But when it comes to wisdom, that you can seek it. You can ask for it. And God will give it to you within his guidelines and his context of his word and his Holy Spirit. But you can't just make it happen because you want it to be there. I mean, I was not very smart in school. I was determined I was going to learn certain things. I didn't make me learn them. <laughs> A lot of things I still don't understand that I went to school for. Most of it I've forgotten. Grammar is one of them. No chuckling. I know y'all know that. Words coming out of my mouth. Jack even told me, he said, you don't only say the wrong words. Sometimes you make up words. <laughs> well, if there wasn't one to fit, I'll find one. But, um, and let me go ahead and just bring this up too. Why is it grammatically correct instead of grammatically correct? Think about that. It's grammar. It's not grammatic. So if you're not speaking good grammar, you should say I'm not grammatically correct. Isn't that the way it should be? I want to write a book on that. And that's all I got on it, so it'd be a short book. But anyway, moving on. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11 says, There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of who? All, not the one. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to other gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing them to each one individually as who? He wills. As he wills to give, that's what we seek. And see, that's very important that we understand too because there are many people that speak so much about the gifts of the Holy Spirit that they want a gift. They want this gift. I want that gift. And they pray for that gift. Well, what we need to be praying for is, Lord, if it be your will that I have that gift, then let me have it. But rather, we should be praying, fill me with whatever gift you want to give me in order that it may minister to someone else because it's to profit all, not for myself. And see, the thing about the gift of tongues that has been so unbalanced is that they focus on that so much to the point that if you don't have that gift, you can't have any of the others. You're not filled with the Spirit unless you have that gift. That is not biblical. That is nothing. There's nothing in the Word that says that. According to this passage, the Spirit, as He sees fit, may give someone a gift of tongues, someone a gift of interpretation, but He may give somebody else a totally different gift and never give them either one of those gifts. That's what the Bible teaches. So we have to be careful that we don't start selecting and you know going to the grocery store of God. And say, okay, God, uh, I've, got, I've, got, I've got my list here, so I'm going to go to aisle 3 to get this, and I'm going to go to aisle 2 to get this, and aisle 15 to get that. And you go to the aisle and pick up whatever you want. Well, what if he wanted you to go to aisle 8? Well, you didn't see anything on aisle 8 you wanted. Then you're walking in the wrong direction, and you're seeking the wrong things. We're to seek what he has and what he wills for us, not what we want for ourselves. All of these gifts, now Paul says, they're to be desired. I desire the gifts, but don't idolize them. Don't make it about the gift. As you grow, God will give you exactly what gifts you need when you need them. And the gift of wisdom will come as he sees fit to give you wisdom on whatever you need wisdom for and understanding and guidance and all the things that come along with it. But we have to understand that it comes from Him. And we're to desire Him first. And then let Him give us the gifts as He sees fit. 
and wisdom as He sees fit. Not just because we want it, but because He wants to give it to us, knowing that it's what we need when we need it. Now verse 26, And I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be trapped by her. Now this this particular verse goes hand in hand with the theme of the book of Proverbs. And the theme of the book of Proverbs is grab a hold of wisdom and stay away from the wicked snares. And particularly, a lot of the words in Proverbs are talking about uh, wicked women who grab a hold and pull you into their homes. You know, it's talking about harlots. It's talking about that type of thing. And, and, and for men, the book of Proverbs is primarily focuses to men. Matter of fact, there's very few passages in Proverbs till you get to 31 that really talks about a godly woman. But the book of Proverbs and the reason that it's designed for men is it's telling us and teaching us and showing us guard yourself against the wisdom of the world and the ways of the world because they will ensnare you and they will pull you down. Guard yourself. And it says here, the woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters because she's out to grab a hold of men and Satan will use ungodly women to pull godly men down is a snare it's a snare and we have to be very careful and that's one reason I think that we we decided to go through the book of Proverbs in the men's group so that we can go through and 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 pray together and 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 read through the scriptures and see how it applies in our lives because nobody's immune there's nobody's immune from the evil in this world and we're not hidden away from it. And we have to be careful. You know, it's interesting, you know, you find different groups and different sects around the world that in Christianity where, you know, may, they may have monks or something and they, they hide themselves away in isolation so that they won't be tempted by the world. But they still have their mind. You cannot escape what's in this world, though you try to escape the world. If you lived any time in this world, you've already been tempted. You've already, been, you've already seen it. You already know, and it's in your mind, and you have, to, you have to come back to the Lord and guard yourself moment by moment, day by day. And it's part of what he's talking about here. Verses 27 and 28. Here's what I found, says the preacher. Adding one thing to another to find out the reason, which my soul still seeks out, but I cannot find. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among these all, among them all I have not found. And truly this is only I have found that God made man upright, but they sought out many schemes. Now, if you read this in the old King James, it's basically saying I found one righteous man among a thousand and not one woman among them all. Now, I'm not going to really dive into that one. Um, but understand where Solomon's coming from how many wives how many concubines hundreds hundreds and he's probably seen every trick under the book of these women manipulating because most of these women were not godly women they were women from whoever and wherever they weren't Jews not all of them I'm sure some of them were but they weren't from his own people and what did God warn him in the very beginning you know don't intermarry don't do this because when you do this these women will pull you away and draw you away from 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 me to be tempted to serve their gods and Solomon did just that the wisest man to the date he was the wisest man and he let that part of himself go he didn't guard himself with the very things that he taught about in this book and in Proverbs he didn't guard himself and he wound up not following God in the end of his days. And so when he's writing this, but a one, one woman among them all I haven't found, well, probably among the women he knows, he's probably right. Because he didn't see godly women. And again, this takes us back to the other things that we've seen. He was also not only the wisest man, but he was the richest man. 
Nothing was out of his reach. He got what he wanted. He had the money to buy it. He had the power to persuade. He had, I mean, you know, and think about this too, is that ungodly women will flock toward men with money and power because that gets them what they want. He had all this around him. And he says, you know, not one woman among all have I found to be righteous. But he wasn't looking in the right place. And see, this is where, as men, we have to guard ourselves because we need godly women in our lives to keep us in line. We need godly women to be able to rein us back when we get a little bit weirded out. And I'm not talking sexually. I'm talking, at this point, I'm talking just in general. You know, we get weirded out. And our wives have, sometimes have that balance to be able to pull us back in. Well, my wife does. She brings me in more times than she even realizes she does. And sometimes she does realize that she does. She gives that little smirky grin. And that's okay. <laughs> but it does say here that God made man upright. But they've sought out many schemes. And there's a bunch of schemes out there. Money-making schemes. People schemes. This scheme, that scheme. Scams. I mean, it's happening. I've even now found, I think my work email has been hacked to a sense, one degree. It's nothing major yet. But one of the other people in the office is getting emails from me, thanking them for the business they did and paying a bill to me. They, they owe me money. It's got my name signed on it. And it's just coming from my office to the other office. But who knows who else it might be sent to. That's how they do. They go in there. And, and what, they do, what they do is... The way the computer scams work is they set something up to, they use people's name that other people know, so they'll click on whatever link they've attached to it so they can download a virus or maybe get all of their personal information. So if you get a, anybody gets a, an email from me and thanking you for a bill or there's any link on there, don't click on it. Because that's just, again, something that's going on out there. We live, I mean, I mean we're living in a world where people are trying and scheming to con and scam other people. That's what they live for. That's what they live for. And we have to be guarded on every turn. You know, I've also gone to jail because I owe the IRS. I've gotten that phone call two or three times. It's a tape-recorded call. You know, this is your last warning. You have a warrant for your arrest. The IRS is coming to get you. Well, they know where I'm at. <laughs> you know? Let them come. But we have to be careful, and we need to walk in wisdom, and we need to approach life from the godly perspective, not from the worldly perspective. And like I said, Solomon was trying to walk out both, and everything he did, it shows how it ended up. This is a story of comparing apples to, to, to oranges, and each time when you take the apple, which would be in God's perspective out of the picture, and you start walking with the orange, the worldly perspective, it always ends up the same way. Everything we've read has always ended up the same way. Misery. Brokenness. And suffering. So we're to keep our eyes on the prize. And our prize is Jesus Christ. Keep our eyes on him through every circumstance of life. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your continual blessing and teaching. We ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus that you do give us wisdom. We seek and, and knock and ask for the wisdom that comes from God because, Lord, if we don't have your wisdom, we have nothing. We can't stand against the enemy because the enemy knows the word better than we do, and he knows how to twist it and how to manipulate it and how to make it sound one way or the other. And we need your spirit to give us wisdom about your word so that we are not tripped up by the enemy or the world. We thank you for your provision. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. May you, Lord, continue to draw your people closer to you. We thank you and praise you. And all God's people said, amen and amen.